In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and as always, it's great to be with all of you. And as always, we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. And in the Hail Holy Queen, we invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us, to pray with us, and to pray for us. And let's beg Mary to bring us to the very heart of Christ. Because as St. Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort says, Mary is the quickest, the easiest, the shortest, pathway to Christ. Together. Hail Mary. Full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary. Mother of God. Pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we'd like to invite to be with us our spiritual director. Spiritual director has many wonderful titles. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. Our spiritual director is also known as the gift of gifts. Our spiritual director is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. Our spiritual director is also known as the counselor. Counselor as well as our consoler. Spiritual director is also known as <clears throat> the sweet guest of our souls. Holy, the Holy Spirit is also known as our interior master. Our interior master, St. Paul and his spiritual masterpiece, his letter to the Romans. Chapter 8, he says we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But good news, the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say Abba. <clears throat> Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to, to be with us, to pour his light into our intellect, and to set our hearts on fire with divine love as we pray the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. And that is, come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. And enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit 
we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Andrew, pray for us. All God's holy apostles, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, Pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. How true it is, my friends, the family that prays together stays together, and a world at prayer is a world at peace. So after praying with you, I will be, by words of encouragement, I will be praying for you later on when I celebrate my holy sacrifice to the Mass in honor of St. Andrew the Apostle today, the last day of November. in honor of St. Andrew, the Apostle. We'll be talking about him today. And I'd like to place you on the altar in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and offer various intentions. The first intention I'd like to offer Well, they like to pray in a special way that all of us would be open to the Holy Spirit. In fact, our sanctification depends in large part in large part upon our openness to the Holy Spirit. Perhaps this can be our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My next intention, I'd like to pray in a special way for our for our family members. For our family members. For the conversion of our family members, for the sanctification of our family members, and for the salvation of our family members. Our Lord said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be given to you besides. And my friends, I'd like to pray also for the dying. For the dying. That God would have mercy on them. That through our prayers, through the chaplain of divine mercy, through the rosary, 
through the Mass, that those who will be dying sometime today, that they would open their hearts to God's mercy, because God is slow in mercy and rich in forgiveness, and be saved. So there we have it, my friends. Those are, are the intentions I like to place on the altar for us today. One brief comment before entering into the feast day we celebrate today. Today we celebrate the feast day of St. Andrew Apostle. Is that we are in between the solemnity of Jesus Christ, the King of the Universe. And this up upcoming Sunday, which will be Advent, and this will actually be the first Sunday of Advent, entering into entering into a, a new church year. It will actually be letter B, so we'll be reading through the Gospel of St. Luke during this next church year. So just invite all of us uh, in this interim between Christ the King, as well as the beginning of Advent, the new church year, to um, beg for the, the grace that Christ, that Christ will be our King, and Mary will be our Queen, that we can say, Que viva Cristo Rey, Christ will be our King, and Mary will be our Queen. Let's beg Mary for the grace that Christ will reign over our memory, that Christ will reign over our intellect, that Christ will reign over our imagination, that Christ would reign over our emotions and feelings, that Christ will reign over our, our hearts, that Christ will reign over our souls, that Christ would govern our body and our passions, that Christ will also, he'll also reign over even our intentions, that, as St. Paul says, whether you eat or drink, do everything for the honor and glory of God. That's right. Whether we eat or drink, do everything for the honor and glory of God. So may we not only say, Que viva Cristo Rey, with our lips, but also that we would live it with our lives. And as the Second Vatican Council says, one of the biggest scandals today is there is a, a dichotomy or separation between the faith that we profess with our lips and there's the faith that we don't always live with our lives. There's a disconnect. There's a separation, there's a disconnect between the faith we profess with our lips, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and the faith that we don't always live with our lives. So let's pray that we be congruent, we be harmonious, that our words and our actions will will be in harmony, will be in uniformity. Okay, my friends. Today, today the church celebrates a great saint. Today the church celebrates Saint Andrew. Let's go through some of the some of the um, elements in the life of Saint Andrew. The word Andrew, coming from Greek, means 
manly or strong. Let's beg St. Andrew for the grace to be really strong in our faith. The end of our talk, we'll talk about the way that he died. All of the apostles, all the 12 apostles, except Judas Iscariot, who hanged himself, all of them died as martyrs, with the exception of one, and that was St. John the Evangelist. They did try to kill him more than once, but God wanted him to not to die as a martyr. According to tradition, he lived until he was about 100 years old, preaching, love one another as I've loved you. But the other apostles, they had the grace, and I say the grace to die as martyr. And over the past 10 days, we've had almost every other day, we've been celebrating a martyr. St. Cecilia, the Vietnamese martyrs, Miguel Pro, St. Catherine of Alexandria. All of these are men and women that shed their blood for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All of these. And actually, Miguel Pro was on the, the day of Thanksgiving. His last words were, Que viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. So the word Andrew. Okay, so Andrew... Andrew was the brother of Simon Peter as James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were brothers. Andrew lived along Lake Galilee, Gal Bethsaida, along Lake Galilee. And with Simon Peter and James and John, they were fishermen. That was their profession. They were fishermen, but they would eventually be called to be fishers of men. Beautiful transfer, isn't it? They were fishermen called to be fishers of men. Some, I'd like to go through some of the... Some of the... Um, Biblical passages that speak about St. Andrew and highlight their meaning. Can we encounter, we encounter St. Andrew in the very first chapter of the Gospel of St. John? Andrew standing next to another apostle that was most likely St. John the Evangelist. They were standing next to John the Baptist. So Andrew was being formed by the great St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist would have been his mentor, his teacher, his formator. And how important it is, my friends, that we have good teachers, we have good mentors, we have good spiritual directors, we have good counselors. We all should have someone that's going to, that's a good source of teaching for us, formation. A good spiritual director, you might even say. So he was the school of the great John the Baptist. Jesus will go on to say that all men born of women, none was greater than John the Baptist. But I'm highlighting the, port, the importance of formation. My teaching this year is basically dedicated to teaching adults of First Communion children in Spanish and English 
and teaching the adults the confirmation, the confirmation parents, their faith, teaching them their faith. teaching them their faith. You know, we really can't give what we don't have. And the first teachers of faith are the parents. Other parents. So John the, John the Baptist is forming Andrew and John the Evangelist, and perhaps others among the apostolic group. So one day, John the Baptist is standing with them, and Jesus walks in front of them. And John the Baptist points to Christ, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which is the prayer that we actually have in Holy Mass. Now what happens is, Andrew and John, they, they follow Christ. Christ hears their footsteps. He turns around and says, Who are you looking for? And they say, Rabbi, which means teacher, where do you live? And he says, Come and see. So they go, they accompany him. And they spend the afternoon with him. And St. John the Evangelist Highlighting the importance of that day, that hour, says that this was the 10th hour, which would be 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So they spent that afternoon with the Lord, in which they're getting to know him in a personal way. My friends, we're called to spend time with Christ. That's right. We're all called to spend time with Christ. Those who have done the spiritual exercises, we call this the holy hour, not the happy hour, but we call it the holy hour. We want to spend quality time with the Lord on a daily basis. By doing that, we're getting to know Christ better, to love him, and he's becoming the very center of our lives. He's becoming, as they say in Spanish, el amigo que nunca falla, the friend that will never fail us. But there is a sequel to this. There's a sequel to this. Andrew Andrew is so overflown with joy in this encounter that he's made with Christ. He's so overflowing with joy that he can't keep it to himself. So as a consequence of this encounter between the Baptists and Andrew and then Jesus and Andrew, Andrew runs to his brother, his older brother, Simon Peter. And he says, we found the Messiah, which means the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Come and see. Andrew could have given him more details, but Andrew was really relying upon this fact. That once his brother Simon Peter encountered Christ, that would be enough. And sure enough, when Jesus sees him, he says, You are Simon, your name will be Peter, Petro. So 
So already we see, my friends, a characteristic. We already see a very beautiful virtue of the person of Andrew. And it's the fact that Andrew, Andrew is bringing people to Christ. So as I talk about this saint, I'm going to invite all of us to try to imitate some of these virtues that we're learning in the lives of the saints today, especially in the life of Saint Andrew the Apostle. Andrew, overflowing with joy, could not keep the joy of his encounter with Christ to himself, but rather Andrew felt called to bring others to Christ and Christ to others. So Andrew brought his brother, Simon Peter, to Christ. So let's take that as an invitation for ourselves. Let's see if we can bring, see if we can bring Christ to others and others to Christ. Pope John Paul II, one of the greatest teachers, preachers, missionaries in the Catholic Church, said this, one of the best ways for us to grow in our faith in Christ is to bring others to Christ. to bring others to Christ. Probably this very day, all of you know someone, someone who is possibly a non-believer or the biggest religious group in our country are non-practicing Catholics. I think you all know someone that is wandering in no man's land. T.S. Eliot, the great English poet of last century, calls it wasteland in his poem. Wasteland. There are many that are wandering through a, a moral, spiritual wasteland. Maybe we can point them to Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So, we're going through some of the beautiful virtues of St. Andrew. Another one is the following. This we can follow in the Gospel for today. is taken from St. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 22. And what we have in the gospel today is the following. John chapter 1, we have this, this encounter between Jesus, Andrew, and John the Evangelist. But perhaps, perhaps the following of Christ was not total in that first encounter, John chapter 1. Whereas in Matthew chapter 4, and then you can see a parallel verse in Luke chapter 5, the first verses in Luke chapter 5, there's a parallel verse. Jesus now is walking along Lake Galilee. And he saw two brothers, Simon, Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting their nets into the sea. 
because they were fishermen. And there's another point I'd like to highlight. These men were hard workers. They worked hard. Fishing was a, a very demanding profession. Imagine going to a lake and having the, this heavy net and you're throwing it in your and you're pulling you're hauling in the net, you don't catch anything. Maybe you do it if you're fishing the whole night, maybe you're doing it who knows, maybe twenty five to thirty times. Sometimes you you don't catch anything. So it's a very hard demanding profession and sometimes frustrating. But the point I'm trying to highlight is that Andrew, his brother Peter, James and John, they were uh, they, they they worked very hard. They were hard workers. Let's stop and examine our own lives as we're in the interim between Christ the King and the first Sunday of Advent. Are we hard workers? What is your work ethic? And I would say our work, our work can be divided into different categories. We all have to work. St. Paul says, if you don't work, then you shouldn't eat. St. Paul says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. God said to Adam, you should earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. So we're all called to work in one way or another. We're all called to work in one way or another. We're called to work, my friends, with our body, with our minds, and with our hearts. We're called to work with our hands. Physical work and physical labor is, is good for us. But ascending to a higher level, working with our minds, our intellects, is even more noble. Elevating it to an even more sublime level is working with our souls. The other day, yesterday, I was speaking about physical exercises as well as spiritual exercises. And they talked about the chariots of fire, how athletes, when they arrive at the Olympic Games, they're training themselves years before, how we're called as athletes of Christ to do spiritual exercises, to be exercising our hearts, our minds, our souls, training our souls, that we can become athletes for Christ and win, run the good race, fight the good fight, and receive the merited crown, which is the crown of eternal life. So Jesus is walking along the shore and they're working they're casting the nets into the sea. Now Jesus says to them, come after me. Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Pescador de hombres in Spanish. Come after me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, the verse that follows is very telling. And it says, at once, they left their nets and followed him. Now, that's a very telling verse. It says, at once, they left their nets and followed Christ. And if you go through the gospel, <clears throat> that's not always the case. This year we've been reading the Gospel of St. Luke. 
and Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem, and he's arrived at Jerusalem now. And he asks this man, come and follow me. And he says, yes, Lord, but I first have to tend my field and my animals. Then the Lord asks another man, come and follow me. Well, I, I just got married. Well, wait a little bit. And the Lord says, come and follow me. And the man says, yes, Lord, but I first had to bury my father died and I have to bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. You'll come and follow me. So those are three. And then you have the rich young man. So these are four different cases where our Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ invites them to follow him. But they all find excuses. One, he's got his land and his animals. Another, he's got his honeymoon to make. Another one, he's got to bury his dead father. And the rich young man is, he's dominated by his money and his possessions. That is not the case with the apostles today. And they, they did have, they had their boats, they had their nets, they had their fishing industry. They had their security. They knew the lake. So they they had a they had a real security. James and John worked with their father, the Zebedee business. They had their security. But Jesus said, Come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. I like to underline that word. It says, at once. They left their nets and followed him. At once. They did not say, let me think this through. But right away they followed Christ. <clears throat> Let's stop and reflect upon that. Let's stop and reflect upon that. How often has it happened where the Lord challenges us to do something. And instead of saying yes, we say, well, maybe a little bit later. Uh, yes, but upon this condition. In other, way, in other words, we make excuses. We, we can easily make excuses. Or we can procrastinate. You probably have heard this, La Filosofia de la Mañana. Have you heard that before? La Filosofia de la Mañana. Well, I'll do it a little bit later. St. Augustine says, Christ is the pilgrim that knocks at the door, and he knocks and knocks and her perhaps he never returns again. We read in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever opens up the door, I will come in and sup or dine with him, and he will sup or dine with me. So we have to be careful. Not to be putting Christ off. Not to have this philosophy de la mañana, but rather, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. In Isaiah, in his vocation in the temple, here I am, Lord, send me. We have to be ready and willing and docile to the calling of Christ. So we see here just a real, a real docility, a real openness. So every day the Lord is calling us, as he, as he was calling the apostles in the gospel today. So they left their nets and followed Christ. The Lord is calling and forming his first followers. 
So the gospel today continues. It says that Jesus walked along from there and saw two other brothers. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Now, Andrew and Peter were, th were casting the nets. James and John, they were in their boat. They were in their boat with their father Zebedee. And they were mending their nets. So she here's a here's a family business. That's right. There's a family business. James and John mending the nets. Andrew and Peter casting their nets. Now, it says that he called them, James and John, and here's the word, immediately. They left their boat and their father and followed him. So the gospel for today the gospel for today is the call or vocation of the apostles. The apostles. We've got two sets of brothers. Peter and Andrew. Andrew, whose feast day we celebrate today. Then James and John. James and John. And it says that they followed him immediately. For your information, over the past couple years, we have those, the wonderful series of Jonathan Rumi called Chosen. In these series, you can see Jesus calling and choosing and forming the apostles. I believe there are many beautiful lessons that are that can be taken from chosen by Jonathan Rumi. You really see the humanity of Christ and the way he deals with the apostles. The only thing we can do, my friends, is get closer to Christ. St. Ignatius says, intimate knowledge of Christ that we love him more ardently and follow him more closely. So where else do we see Andrew and his personality and his workings? So one of the highlights of the greatness of St. Andrew is the fact that he cannot keep the joy of the gospel, the joy of Christ to himself. Rather, Andrew feels that he really has to bring, Andrew really has to bring Christ to others and others to Christ. So we see that Andrew goes and he brings Philip. Philip to Christ. And it's almost as if it were a domino effect. That Philip goes and he brings Nathaniel or Bartholomew to Christ. He says, I said, it's like a domino effect. It's a domino effect. One brings another. And I think, honestly, my friends, that we're called to do the same thing. We're called to do the same thing. We're called to bring 
others to Christ. Yes. We're called to bring others to Christ. Now there's another another detail or event in the life of St. Andrew worthy of note. And it's this. Our Lord is deeply engaged in his apostolic work that three years ministry where he's preaching and teaching and he's carrying out miracles and he's doing exorcisms and he's never neglecting prayer of course we share lord separating himself and entering into dialogue or communion in fact, before choosing the 12 apostles, our Lord actually spends the whole night in prayer on the mountain. Then he, choose, he chooses the 12 apostles. But there's another element. Christ, uh, Andrew, and Philip they introduced the Greeks to Christ. That's right. So there's a, another connection. The word Catholic means universal. Andrew is a man who's able to bring anyone to Christ. Starting with his brother, and then Philip, and then the Greeks. Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat does not fall to the ground and die, it does not bring forth fruit. But if it falls and dies, it brings forth abundant fruit. Speaking a little bit more elevated language to the Greeks who are known for their, for their philosophical underpinnings. But that's not the last of it. He brings the Greeks... And then there's another event which is in harmony with the person of Andrew. Jesus immersed in his public life. He's preaching and teaching. And the sun is going down. And thousands of people are following Christ. And as the sun is going down, the apostles tell the Lord to send the, the people to the neighboring villages so they can get they can get something to eat. And our Lord says, "You go and you give them something to eat." So there's a little boy with five loaves and two fish. And guess who's the one that introduces the little boy with the five loaves and the two fish to Jesus? Go ahead and guess. Who do you think the one is that brings this, introduces this little boy with five loaves and two fish to Christ? None other than St. Andrew. Once again. St. Andrew is always making these connections between people and Christ. And our Lord tells them to sit down and he takes the loaves and the fish, raise your eyes to heaven, thanks God, and there is the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. But it was actually St. Andrew once again that makes this, this connection. What a wonderful person St. Andrew is. He's a heartwarming person. These social relationships. He must have been someone of a very good temperament. He must have been someone that was joyful. Someone that was very enthusiastic. 
someone who knew how to deal with people, someone who had tact and discretion. In other words, a, a person that was very good, had a lot of really very good qualities, very good qualities on a human level. Then we encounter Andrew. Andrew is at the Last Supper. The Last Supper, Andrew is, uh, he's basically ordained a priest and a bishop. There at the Last Supper, Lord, you know, he institutes the most holy Eucharist, but he also institutes, our Lord also institutes holy orders. So Andrew is among the first priests as well as bishops in the Catholic Church. But I have to say that the almost as if the culminating moment of the transformation of Andrew would be after our Lord has ascended into heaven and he says to Andrew and the other apostles, go out to the whole world. Teach them all I taught you and baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always. Behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Then Andrew goes with the other apostles to the upper room with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Andrew spends nine days and nine nights with the Blessed Virgin Mary in silence and prayer and fasting and penance. And Angel, with the apostles, undergoes a radical metamorphosis or transformation there on the day of Pentecost, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit in the form of tongues of fire. Forms of tons, tongues of fire. And he's transformed. So Andrew, he becomes a missionary. According to a tradition, he became a missionary and he preached about Jesus in the area around what's called the, around the Black Sea. And tradition tells us that he preached in, in northern Greece, Turkey, and Scythia, now the, the southern part of Russia. And Andrew died as a martyr. And tradition says that in Patras, P-A-T-R-A-S, Patras, in Greece, he was crucified. He was tied to a cross shaped like the letter of an X. And it says he was there a long time, perhaps several days, where he was preaching to the people. There we see his name, Andrew, means manly or strong. So we have the letter X. And ever since then a cross in the shape of an X has been called St. Andrew's Cross. 
So let's rejoice in the Feast of St. Andrew and beg for the grace through Mary, the Queen of the Apostles, that like St. Andrew, we'd be filled with joy and share the good news of Jesus Christ with the whole world. I invite you to share my message, our message, to the whole world. In honor of St. Andrew, I'd like to impart to all of you my priestly blessing. And Jesus says, go out to the whole world and bring the good news. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.